Uh, um, well, thank you for coming out, everybody, uh, on a snowy night. Uh, sorry Ben can't be here, um, but I'll, I'll try to stand in my best. Uh, Marlon and I have been friends for a long time. It's glad to have you back. You do? And uh, what I thought we'd do is start with a little bit of poem. I thought we were going to start with Trash and Ben. <laughs> <laughs> You're right, it's Wolverine. I mean, come on. <laughs> anyway. All right, so I'm going to just read that because I'm going to read it through three really quick parts. Um, for, for those of you who, who um, haven't read the book yet or don't know, so Moonmage Spider King tells the story, the, essentially the story of Black Leopard Red Wolf from Sogolon's point of view. And Sogolon was sort of one of the villains in the previous book. And she takes over the story here. And um, the first section that, that I, I'm re I'll read, that's pretty short, is actually when she got the name Sogolan. Um, so you know, she escapes her her home and actually quite accidentally ends up in a brothel. And this is her how she ends up leaving that brothel. Um, what do you need to know? So Sogolan has a trick that she does whenever, even though she works in a brothel, she actually doesn't sleep with anybody. She usually drugs them and robs them. Okay. Hell yeah. <laughs> Get that cash. <laughs> um, but here's a, a situation where it kind of backfires. So she stole this talisman from somebody, and she didn't know the talisman is actually connected to a monster. So the monster has broken into the brothel and pretty much destroyed the whole place. And now that same monster called Okundunka is standing right beside her. You better thank the gods you're not a boy thief, or I'd be calling ten men to pull the Okundunga out of your little shithole, that woman say. She, a lady looking like somebody of great nobility and importance, her dark lips and wide nose in a frown, her annoyed eyebrows sitting below a pattern of white dots that run, along, run down her left cheek, an igia on her head like a large black flower, and a long white basota blanket around her shoulders with the pattern of a warrior with with spear and shield. A tall woman and wide though she's not fat. She looks like she can hold all her children at once. Cheeks of a woman who will laugh without warning, without joke. The little girl is still trembling. The Ukundunka pawing at her sleeping sheets as if trying to pull her in. Where is it, little girl? The little girl can't get the words out. Where? where? The talisman, little fool, my little figure in onyx, don't make me ask for it again, or I'll let him search you. The Okundunga lowers his head right down in front of her, a head long like a horse, eyes like a wolf, teeth like a crocodile, breath like she don't know. They are one, you understand me? The Okundunga and the talisman, they are one. Let me tell you a story. Once, after we long married, I said to my husband, Dearest husband, everybody know that you are an important man. Everybody know that it is important business that keep you out late at night. The God knows how I worry. I worry so much, I ask a conjurer to make something to keep my husband safe. Yes, husband, I said. You carry this talisman with you and the Okundunka will protect you. An important man like you with enemies everywhere. Why, you could be in a ditch. So every night, if I flip the hourglass more than five times and there's no sign of my husband, I send this Ukundunka searching for the talisman <laughs> to keep him safe, you understand? <laughs> Lo, one night he not only come home late, but he come home without it. Lost, he said. He said, don't bother find it for I don't know where it gone. I said, don't worry, husband. I soon find it and deal with who take it. No, it look, no, it look like you're resting in the bosom of a whore. I'm not a whore. You're in a whorehouse. Uh, it's not good you're a nun. <laughs> I'm not a whore. You, you're not a cook. I'm not no whore, oh. Then why this room smell of men? The little girl have no answer. She could have said that, yes, the room stunk of men, but none of that stink is on her. But talk of sleeping poison would lead to Miss Azura finding out. The noble woman I heard deep inspecting her. Hmm. Maybe you can give him a child. I'm certainly not about to suffer one. Certainly not with him. 
<laughs> the shock on your face. You really are a child. I, I never whore. I never whore with none of them. Never, eh? I rob them. The little girl is getting more disturbed by the woman's stare than by the Okundunka's hiss. But then her frown break into a smile. Gold, curry, money notes, talk to me, girl. The little girl can do nothing but stare at her again. She wonders if this is what grown women do. Unveil and unveil, surprise and surprise, until the only thing one can expect from her is wonder. I take whatever they have that shouldn't be hanging loose, and I keep it, for Mrs. Zura give us nothing. Nothing at all? Your clothes? We, we buy that. I say she don't give us nothing except for one thing. She give us all our rape the first time she sell us, and charge the man triple money. So I mix them a portion, and then I rob them. Ah. So they take nothing from you, but you take plenty from them? See here, girl, you in the wrong house. And not leaving one user for another. Who say you even have use? The little girl leave with the noble woman that night. Miss Azura said nothing. Miss Azura don't move from the spot where the Okundunka throw her, so who knows what is the fate of her. The noble woman asked the woman, asked the girl her name. I don't have none. What? What do people call you? Little one, little dung, little girl, little whore, girl, forbidden lily. Enough. You choose a name and that is what we will call you. I call my mother Sogolan. See the girl, take her dead mother's name, 177 years ago. 177 times the great girl of the world spin around the sun. Sogolan. Keep it in the whole name thing. Since we talk, since I just read the part where Sogolan becomes Sogolan, I'm going to read the part where Sogolan becomes New Witch. Um, all you need to know is that somebody asked her to bring back a girl, and she brought back the girl. And let's just say the people who had the girl are no longer living with us. <laughs> um, so Sogolan developed a reputation really quick. From then on, the old woman bring plenty of women. Most of them she don't know. I warned them that I was a ruthless woman, and if you send me into any place, say for any woman or child, I am the only one leaving there alive. That sent away certain women, but urge others. I can know your name, she asked me one night. No. You want to know mine? No. The woman, they add name or name missing. Which of the full silver moon is what they call you? I got no quarrel with the name. She laughed. It's too fussy fussy. Which of the full silver moon? Who have time to say all of that? In Sosily, they would just call you Moon Witch. One day, the old woman stopped coming. Dead, I assume, but didn't ask. It didn't stop the woman who either come with somebody who speak a north tongue or leave a note on parchment if they have money. There is no woman called Sogolan. Nobody in this region need that name, so nobody use it. The moon witch cheat death more than once, more than twice, more than ten times, so she cannot die. The moon witch is death herself. She been roaming the salt lands from before Quash Moki died, after being king. And she roaming after his son took the name and become king for seventy and one years until he too died. So yes, a witch, though she never once, once took up witchcraft. So yes, a ghost, though she don't haunt the living. For what reason any woman have for living that long, they say. They, the women, who find themselves calling on her to help for peculiar problems, or men quaking in their bones when they find out they're the problem. This is what the women say. She only help women. Each one reach one who tell another who claim to know her, or at least where in the sunk city you can leave a message that she will get. Those who leave a note whisper their desire and leave a down payment in silver. She don't take gold. You will feel like a fool, they said, whispering your business. But the gray pirates here, and they take the words to her exactly as you say it. For if you come to the moon witch, it is because you don't have nowhere left to go, and nobody left to help. So yes, women come to her with a mountain of problems, and nine times out of ten, that problem is a man. This is what the men say. Whether they are drinking beer in a tavern, or watching them lose themselves in an opium den, the men speak the same. The first moon, nothing. 
Six moons later, one or two men talk about a string of murders in Masi and Marabanga and how the secret police don't know murder or keeping secret from them. One year later, two drunkards wondering if God has set vengeance on men but no women. Man losing sleep and not afraid to walk the streets at night, but the women don't feel unsafe at all. Now they be the ones walking alone and among their kind at night. Two years after that, they learn that they're women keeping secrets, as if this is something new. Five years or six, seven men and women lead to form a search gang to find out who is this killer of the new moon that no sheriff think to live. Eight years and it turned into a song and joke, how some evil spirit or monstrous beast roaming the streets. It tempt me to take a piece of their bodies so they can ponder what creature this is that take that as a trophy. It take 10 and 1 years for any man to notice that the woman know. When a man said that to me, I ask him if that mean it take him 10 years to finally listen to his woman. Certain men start to see that the woman knows something. Days come and gone, kings live and die, but the woman keep it as a woman's affair. Not a secret, just not for man's knowledge. All but two whose husband and father beat it out of them. The husband take himself to the sun city, but the gorillas deal with him before I even see. The father come to the forest dressed like a woman, and even whisper a request to the parrots. But he keep demanding to see me, which is something no woman ever demand. That one I let live, when the sight of the mighty gorillas, one with the rotting head of the husband, make him piss and shit himself. This is what the woman said. That this year a moon witch been haunting the sun city for over a century. So maybe she was a real woman once, but she's something else now. Sogolon would laugh at such talk, for nothing about this world worth living so long in it. But I don't go by Sogolon. Thanks. No. <laughs> sitting in your office above the shop on Franklin Avenue when you were first looking at Madison. Is that like a crab bowl piece now? Mm -hmm. It is, but, it, uh, but it's, no, it's now two points. Mm -hmm. uh, look at a third. Um, so one of the things uh, that's interesting to me, uh, and several people pointed up, but I, I don't want to get into it quite yet, but when we get to the end of the first book and we're in the final showdown. There's a great phrase, uh, uh, at the end of a true story, there's nothing but waste, mm -hmm. and, and, and they're in this, this, this great conflict, and the book ends with an injunction, uh, effectively, to tell a sort of long story. Tell me, the last two words mm -hmm. of the book. Uh, when you wrote those two words, did you know how much of her story you would tell and how far back you would go with it? I pretty much didn't have a clue. <laughs> I love when people seem to think I already wrote all three. Yeah, that's right. I was like, I have no idea what the is going to be about. Um, no, I, I, the only thing I knew is that there were certain gaps in, in Black Pepper and Red Wolf where Sutherland doesn't appear. And that for a huge part of the book, um, she's just thrown through the wrong door and she doesn't come back to the end. So I knew that those gaps I'd have to fill in, but. Um, you know, it's hard talking about it, but, but talking about the book without spoiling it. But most of the stuff that happened in it is, you know, is not it's stuff I didn't know. There's a there's a scene, a part in the book where Sutherland finds herself self with a family, and honestly, she just sort of walks around so stunned, she just keeps calling everybody's name in the dark, and that was really me, because I'm like, how the hell did we end up here? <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, um, I, I, it's crazy. I love pretty much none of that. But you know, I mean, at the same time, I knew I was writing a one hundred seventy seven year old black woman. Yeah. I mean, talk about zero thoughts. <laughs> yeah, it's like, well, that's a, a, an interesting thing about her. The uh, is she can be a little difficult, uh, but she revels in it. Yeah, because we should be easy for her. You know, okay. um, you know, so I, got, you know, I mean, the thing about the thing that was always fun about writing about Sagan is that she always relentlessly defined her own self, and um, and you know, she seen the very pinnacle of power and wasn't impressed, and 
and you know she's seeing and she's 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 literally been from the top to the bottom and and yeah she's just you know really really impressed very few rooms she enters she's not the smartest person in the room um that said you know she does make some bad choices and that's that she, she you know her life still ends up with some serious calamities and some of the issues that people raise against her they're right yeah, um, but yeah, she, um, I don't even think, I, don't, I, I mean, I don't think, I, I'm trying to remember if there's any point where she becomes self-conscious of how she's, she chooses to define, you know, that she chose how to define herself. Well, I think one interesting thing about her, uh, again, without giving too much the book away, is how, you know, she comes to be defined by the world in many ways before she be, even learns language because of her circumstance. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, I, one of the things that struck me was reading the second book and went back to the first as well is, you know, in fantasy, there's a big thing about made up language. We're gonna invent mm -hmm. elvish, we're gonna bag, uh, dragon language, you know, there's yeah. a, and uh, in this book, there's not so much a made up language as a made up uh, use of language, right? Mm -hmm. Kind of a grammar to it. Yeah, okay. yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, you know, I was looking at quite a few languages, but in particular, Wolof. And there isn't a lot of Wolof in the book. In fact, I don't see actual, actual Wolof appears in the book. Um, but there are things I liked about it um, because it reminded me of a lot of Jamaican, a lot of Jamaican patois. Well, um, like one of the rules of, of Wolof grammar is verbs are always present tense, which is also Jamaican patois. I always thought, and like a lot of Jamaicans, that's a sign of backward Jamaican English. But it really isn't. It's a sign that some other grammar system survived the slave ship. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, you know, in Jamaica, there's no went. Nobody went anywhere. It's he did go. You know, or I'm soon go, or I'm can go. He was like, he going go. Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, it's English. It's, I know I was going to, the novel I'm clear was going to be written in English, but I know I wasn't going to play by standard English rules because that's not what I speak. That to me was the way in which um, I could make it not seem too much like, you know, like what a fantasy novel would be, that the rules of the language were, were different. And also, you know, I mean, things that haven't happened in here yet, I mean, it's funny, and, and, it, and it was me kind of trolling. There's a threat of war all the time, but there's no big battle scene. <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody out there going, you said it was African Game of Thrones. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's no uh, But I remember when, when the Hillary Mantle books came out, you and I were talking about one of the things that she does in there that, that is, is true here too is uh, she gave you a language of that mm -hmm. place and the feeling of Cromwell in a way that was English as we speak it. It wasn't deliberately arch. Yeah, and uh, it was in some, but in some ways it was it was more correct. Um, you know, the 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 Van Vell Lois Stewart business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which a lot of people didn't really speak. But that the thing that always stunned me about Wolf Hall and Bring Out the Bodies and, and even and Mirror and the Light was how sort of plain spoken it is. And um and Hero Man is a huge hero of mine, of course. Um the whole time I was writing that book, you know, Wolf Hall was sitting on my desk. Wolf Hall and Beloved. And I just like stare at them. <laughs> and sometimes I'll read them and go, oh, shit. Um, <laughs> um, but you know, I mean I still I think I absorb stuff from, from both of them. But but also, you know, the, 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 the thing that, you know, why Wolf Hall was important to me is that Wolf Hall is about somebody who's power adjacent. And yeah, he, he gets power too, but one of his fatal mistakes is, you know, being royalty adjacent, but not royalty. You know? So it is nice to be rich people adjacent, but not rich. <laughs> yeah, that was, that was not a good time. Um, <laughs> So, you know, uh, in addition to the language, I think one thing that I, you know, one of my, my, my notes when I was reading this is I want to write the Marlon James Monster Manual. Shake it because I'm not doing it. I mean, I have all these pictures of characters from my book, except they're really anatomically correct. <laughs> Extremely anatomical. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, uh, well, I, mean, I can ask you that question. I, you know, I remember reading because there's a there's a character in the book who's a shape shifting lion. He's also really hot. 
Sadu pictures. That's just it. More things to come out on my death. That's right. Yeah. Uh, um, but it's a. So I won't be illustrated. There won't be any illustrated. It won't be my illustrations that appear in the illustrated version. Uh, but there's a rich natural history to this. It's you know the difference between this and Game of Thrones is there's a lot more going on in here. Uh, I think in terms of the world. There's... Yeah. Um, and also Sutherland, because I think Sutherland is um, on one level far more interested in the fate of the world than Tracker was. Um, Tracker is really, you know, if I can, the seeds smell it, taste it, screw it, and, and kill it, then no. God bless him. <laughs> <laughs> Whereas, I think Sutherland, I mean, there is a, we were talking about this before, there is a scene in it where Sutherland and the princess are actually urban planning. They all came for the urban planning part. Of course. <laughs> They're literally looking at architectural plans and thinking which city deserves this and who doesn't. Um, and, and she talks about she talks about cities and architecture and, and how these places are built and who lives there um, quite a bit. Um, you know, because one, because she is nearly 200 years old, but she's also been around long enough to see how things change cities. Like, um, one city is changed because they just started building down and more people got rich. One changed because there's a disaster and the rich moved south, rich moved north and pushed the poor south. Um, she even notices how morals change, like a city where you could walk around topless, not they'll beat you. So she she very much pays attention to just how the world around her changes. The thing I had to remember writing is that she has to change too. Okay, it would have been very easy to do this and make her stay constant. Yeah, yeah. The, um, so one thing in both books uh, um, that, that others have commented on, uh, maybe, you know, superficially, but uh, I don't remember this much sex in The Hobbit. You didn't get the version they sent to Jamaica. Yeah, I missed that. Uh, but but the, the sexual journey of both the tracker and Sunglon is is integral to their characters in yeah. many ways. And hers is uh, actually pretty rich and interesting, even though in some ways it's not. Yeah. I also love that I'm on a 77 year old. Yeah, I'm 177 year old. I'm pretty sure that may be the oldest character in a sex scene ever. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, you go, Grandma. <laughs> Actually, I mean, great, 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 Grandma. You go get yours. Um, well, yeah, it's, it's, well, because, especially with Sogolan, I mean, Sogolan's first experience of any form of sexuality is not consensual is she is in you know she's in a brothel and uh, what and and the the, the 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 owner of the brothel literally sells virginities um and you know and she but but she then goes on to demand and get the type of, of relationship she wants and that was really important to write um you know, that, um, because, yeah, I mean, at one point, this character, she does have a homie better recognized moment and nearly breaks his neck. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, I think it would have been too easy, and, and I think fantasy does this a lot, where they'll just pull the whole, well, you know, it's, that sort of happened in the time. Um, it's like when, uh, you know, it's like every time a Game of Thrones director tried to justify rape, the rape scene, well, you know, it was a time I was like, you clearly have not read your Dark Ages. <laughs> There's no way that shit happened to Eleanor of Aquitaine, <laughs> you know, or, or, and so on. And also, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, um, it's something that happens in a lot of these books sometimes, they deny agency, they deny the character's agency, and, and I remember that someone has to have agency, um, and also kind of sometimes have to screw up. But, um, but also, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a Christian allegory universe. And I think sometimes, even when books aren't necessarily Christian, they're very Calvinist. That's right. And, Paladins. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not it's, it's, and I have to remember that it's not following those rules, you know, those rules at all. No, and that, that, that comes back to that natural history. I think one of the, the rich bits of the two books now together is, um, it's a 
form of world building is fantasy, it's obviously fantasy, um, but it is different in ways in the intensity with which people have personal agency, not just mm. the quest, in which mm. uh, that world's tropes and behaviors are uh, not the ones that we typically see, and, and even that language with it. And you know, one of the things that I, I, I hate to bring up, because um, <laughs> uh, I don't want to forestall the excitement of the third book, but you know, this is quite an achievement already, these two. Um, you and say I can quit? <laughs> uh, um, but as you kind of think through, you know, I remember when we were talking about this before it became a project, um, you've now got two done, and uh, there is the throwaway line, I'm going to write that in Game of Thrones that you'll never have done. Oh my god, I really thought nobody was going to remember that. Uh, um, but it is so much more, and as you kind of think about two books in and, and with the third one mm -hmm. that you're going to start writing as soon as we get back to the trailer. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, is this what you thought it would become, or did it become something much different? It became something much different. I, I just, you know, I, um, I mean, it's funny because I'm an over plotter. I have moleskin notebooks upon moleskin notebooks of, have you seen my notebooks? And I plot to death, and as soon as I start writing, I toss all of them away. Um, because you know the characters become people, and, and you know when characters become people, they surprise and they disappoint. And, um, and I have to you know remember um, all of that. But a lot of what happens in it, I didn't know. The only thing I knew was how it was going to end, because all you know, you know, Sutherland's in jail. Um, well, you know, or is in lockup just as Tracker is. Um, that's really all I knew. Um, for you know, it's it's. I like to say that when I write fiction, I, I, I am this sort of um, journalist for imagining people. Um, can I just get out of the way and let them, you know, get out of the way and let them, oh, it's very long. Yeah, you can do that. <laughs> <laughs> just attribute it to me. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, it's, it's, but that's what I'm doing. I'm sort of going in and getting a story. It's like when people also ask the inevitable, how oh, you write the violence and blah, blah, blah. I was like, I go in and uh, you know, I go in and get the story, you get it as truthfully and as complete, you know, as as you can do it. But um, I already, again, I don't know where the third novel is going, but I kind of know where it's going, and I know what it's about. I also know what the tone would you know would be. But if this is going to be the after Game of Thrones, we got to wait like seventeen years. <laughs> oh God, no! Listen, George says he writes a book every day. You know, George is, I spoke to George R. R. Martin and I was like, why do people keep thinking I'm not going to finish my book? They keep thinking I'm old and decrepit. And he's like, I'm not old, I'm just fat. <laughs> I was like, you know, I can't say that. Um, and yeah, I mean, he's a little way too much at, um, what's the place he's always at? He's at every, every con that exists. Yeah, he's, he's always, all, there's also that, the meow, what's it called? Meow Wolf. He's at Meow Wolf right. like every day. Um, but no, it won't be, for one, that would horrify my publisher. That's right. Um, um, well, I'm excited. Well, hey, everybody. Uh, um, do we have uh, any kind of Q&A set up here? Is this, I think we do. We'll that, probably turn the lights okay. off. I think there are mics. If not, you just have uh, to if show we don't, we can just shout out. But, um, but it is great to have you home. Thank you. <laughs> no, you're a good one. <laughs> I, I, I'll say I write books the way I read books. 
Um, so I can get bored pretty easy. And I also want to be surprised. If it's a surprise for me in the book, trust me, it was a surprise for me when I wrote it. Um, to me, a really good writing day is me going, damn, I never saw that coming. Um, and you know, I, I, I don't know if I necessarily think of, it's funny because I also do think sometimes it helps when you're writing to think of somebody, if not a reader, a listener. Um, John Steinbeck said that, and I actually do believe that, even when you're writing in third person. That said, I don't necessarily have a particular reader in mind. I, I mean, for me, the reader is somebody who takes the books on the book and the books terms. Um, and to me, that's you know that's um, enough because um, I don't necessarily cater to a reader. Um, yeah, I remember um, years ago when uh, I was chopping around my second novel, Book of Night Women, and a publisher that shall remain nameless. Viking books. <laughs> Asked me to cater to their readership by rewriting the whole thing in a Jane Austen English, which I can't do because I totally stand for Jane Austen. Um, but I know, I was like, I was like that, and, and, and her concern was audience. I was like, but you know, that is one, and uh, that's a one, it was a pandering way of looking at audience, and it was also a way of insulting audience's intelligence. I do think I have a really smart reader. Lord knows I have a patient one. <laughs> um, and I just, I just, it's something, even at the really worst moments in trying to get a book deal when I was really trying to get published and couldn't, the one thing I never stopped, never, never started underestimating was the actual audience. I really thought if they could only get the book and so on. Like the readership, I never underestimated. Publishing just took some catching up, but um, but yeah, I think I just I think I just to me ultimately, these are somebody who wants a story that doesn't end the way it began, and that's good enough for me. Thank you. So I, I think this kind of follows up on that, but yeah. what, what was the part of writing this book that you enjoyed the most? Where when you were getting done with that part, you were just like, mm -hmm. hell yeah. You mean other than a really sexy shapeshifting lion? Right. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, that end. Um, what is it? You know, um, I mean, there are lots of this, this book that I, that I really enjoyed. Writing and the parts that I really didn't enjoy necessarily, I was really you know caught up with. Like, I mean, one of the things this book explores, which I don't think I've explored before, which is shocking given the body count in my novels, that I've never written about grief before, and um, and that's something that I explore in this. And I won't say it was fun to do. In fact, it took a lot out of me, and it was a part that took the longest to write. Um, but I did throw myself um, in it. Um, you know, there are little things, like I finally get to write dragons. I was like, in one way, this is way more fantasy than the previous one. There are actual dragons in it saying, yes, they breathe fire. Um, <laughs> you know. But I, 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 I think the, the um, for me, it was, funny enough, the, the, there's a section where Sagar pretty much just withdraws from society. And at one point, I was like, oh my god, this is starting to read like Otessa Mosfei's book. Um, her year of, year of rest and relaxation, because she kind of does a year of rest and relaxation and tell me, I'm going to go reread Otessa's books and I'm not ripping it off. Um, but that was a lot of fun. That, um, and, and, you know, and you know, she sort of becoming more and more that kind of, moving from being like a smart ass to being actually just smart. And that to me was a lot of fun. It's very, it's, it's a lot of fun for me evolve in a character because then it means they're growing and hopefully I'm growing a little bit too but that to me was a fun really really fun part cool thank thanks you. hey so hey. first of all I just want to thank you for like representing I don't know the diaspora in oh. fantasy yeah. me too yeah. like, I don't know I've read so many white dudes fantasy books and like <laughs> <it> just <laughs> There's a level that it just doesn't deliver on mm -hmm. sometimes, so thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, there's, you know, Sophia Samatar is doing cool stuff, and Kaya Shanti Wilson is doing stuff, and my students put me onto Papua, which I didn't know before, and I felt like I did that because I was a teacher. 
Um, which, yeah, I think there, there was just so many, you know, Tommy Adeyemi, um, I can't remember who was it, The Daughters of Neri, Neri, and I can't remember who wrote that. Um, but there's just so much going. I mean, I like, you know, the thing about fantasy, of course, is a lot of fantasies really still medieval Europe with, with witches, right. which is technically medieval Europe. <laughs> um, <laughs> and and also a lot of it follows certain and I, and I there's and there's, there's still a lot of like about that, but I think that um, we're seeing just you know a bigger and broader and wider possibilities and it's exciting. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess I have two quick questions. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned the violence earlier, mm -hmm. and something I noticed in Black Leopard, Red Wolf, and Brief History of Seven Killings especially in Bam Bam's parts, is that there's like almost kind of this frenetic quality of the violence mm -hmm. where like the plot kind of breaks and it stops and you're just in this. And I guess mm -hmm. I'm just curious about what that experience is like. Yeah, well, violence is violent, right. I think. And, um, you know, it's, you know, when people, I mean, I don't necessarily go good show when they go that was disturbing, but I also am glad because violence is disturbing. It's not, there is nothing normal about it. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an aberration on, on, on what we have, and it's a disruption. And you should feel disrupted when you, you read it. Funny enough, you know, I, I, I mean, I still get flack for writing these violence drenched novels, and I always say, you know, the first 15 minutes of John Wick has a bigger body count than my entire catalog. <laughs> um, but it's one thing to write violence, it's another thing to write suffering. And it's one to write violence, and it's another thing to write, um, you know, the consequences of of the violence. I, I read this article in New York Magazine. I highly recommend it that if you can get through it. Called "What Bullets Do to Bodies," mm, yeah. and it was an eye-opening article because you realize uh, I'm writing this TV show, and every now and then they'll make a comment, and I go, "Do you want Hollywood violence, or do you want the real thing?" Because I can write both. Because you know, in Hollywood, they get shoot in the shot in the leg, and they're like, ugh, flesh wound. I'll go save the girl. I'm like, dude, you're not going nowhere with a damn bullet to the leg. You're dying. <laughs> and so, so, but it's, um, it's, yeah, that violence and scenes like that should give you pause because they're not normal. And um, I don't think I dwell too much in them, but I do think that events, and it's not just violence, I think events, certain events resonate reverberate and you know they should yeah thank you and then my other quick question mm. is i'm curious i'm just giving long answers no problem. <laughs> no problem this is great but the role that music played i'm mm -hmm. really curious about that especially because parts of the book almost are in like a musical format mm -hmm. and so i'm curious did you listen to anything while you were writing or was yeah it i'm constantly listening to music well you know when i'm writing um with this book i was listening to a lot of eve tumor um, who, who I think may be the most exciting musician. Now, I was listening to this artist, Lorraine, who I talk about it any chance I get, L apostrophe R E I N, check her out. Um, you know, I was also listening to a lot of Tony Allen um, and, and, you know, the usual people like. Actually, the person who was probably listening to the absolute most was Alice Coltrane. Oh, yeah. Um, I was listening also to Joe Henderson and Alice Coltrane. Um, and just the Elements album, and yeah, because I do write, I do write to music, and I don't, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not, I mean, yes, I think the, the, the sense of rhythm and so on, I definitely latch on to. It's also because I really envy poets. I, I did a reading Saturday after a poet, I'm like, you know, I only have one condition in my, don't call it a writer, don't put me after a poet. <laughs> so yeah, I, I'm still very much interested in musicality, and I'm interested in volume. I mean, I don't know if I wrote it to be musical, but I did write it to be read aloud. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank really you. Appreciate it. Um, so I've, I've been thinking about this question um, mm -hmm. for probably two years since I read. Damn, two years. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, uh, uh, so I'm Ojibwe, and we have uh, uh, a strong oral tradition in mm -hmm. our stories that uh, I really love. And um, reading your stories uh, was something that I saw in fantasy that, like our, our previous uh, 
okay, just vastly. We saw it getting out of Europe in the European mm -hmm. context, which is just amazing for, for those of us who uh, have ancestry uh, from other places, mm -hmm. and, but still love fantasy. Mm -hmm. um, for us, there's a lot of ways that we tell our stories. You know, we, we want to preserve the oral tradition, and there's certain ways that they have to be told at certain times of the year. There's clearly a lot of amazing mythology and myths that we draw from. So thinking about that, thinking that you know, a lot of these are oral traditions, I, I would guess, not knowing as much uh, of, of the African tradition, the West African traditions that we draw from. How do you look at those and um, make sure you kind of uh, do right by those stories, right mm -hmm. by the ones who preserve those traditions and yeah. make sure that you bring them forward in a way that uh, 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 continues that tradition and helps mm -hmm. it to grow to uh, even more people. Yeah. Well, I mean, the first thing I had to remember is to respect those traditions. Um, I know other writers do it. I don't necessarily judge it, but I don't think I'd have like Yemaya as a character in my book um, for the same reason why Gandalf is a Jesus. Uh, um, because it's still, I think these are these are living gods and they're active religions. And I don't know if I may, I don't know if I'd use Shango and made him characters in the book. And I think that's one thing that it's it's um, by yes, I'm clearly inspired by these things, just as how say Tolkien was. But there is a sense of respect and deference that I'm not gonna drag your god through my battle scene. Um, um, there is that. But I also think, you know, it's, um, for me, the, 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 in my sort of way, I think the oral, the last thing I, I respect about the oral tradition, and, and, and even though this is a written book, as I said, it's written to be read aloud. And, um, you know, and I really spent time getting that audio book right, even though I didn't do it. But to me, it's, it's um, recognizing still, even if it's written, keeping the values of oral tradition, like volume. Like, um, you know, the, the, um, the, 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 uh, even the, the way in which the, the narrator may or may not be telling the truth. Like, the thing about oral tradition and oral stories that's really interesting is that if you are listening, you also have to do some detective work. Because as a storyteller, I might be trying to trick you. Or I am not, I'm certainly not coming with a sort of a voice of this is how it went. Because tomorrow I'm going to tell you a different story with the same characters. And it, it, remembering that and keeping that sort of dynamism um, going was something that, that's one of the, the, the very fact that I'm not going to have a fourth volume or I tell you who's telling the truth is in also keeping with the oral tradition. Because one of the things about oral tradition is a lot of the burden of truth is on you, is on your ear as opposed to my tongue. Um, so I think in, in, in a way, even though it's written, those are the ways in which I'm still playing by the rules of oral tradition. And that's one of the things I wanted to do in this series, even if it's written on paper, I'm playing by oral rules. And, um, but also, you know, when I have moments and pulpits like this, to talk about oral stories, you know, um, people, th people you know, think, you know, the Lion King is Simba, the Lion King is Sundiata. Um, you know, and, and, and anybody from Mali can tell you the story of the Lion King. Not to knock the, the film um, and so on, but um, that, you know, those stories, the stories of, I mean, Sanjara, that story from Sundiata is where it got the name Sugalan. She's Sugalan in that story. And, and you know, keeping, you know, what we can do also is, is preserve those oral epics. Not just in writing, but also, you know, in, you know we, we, we can record it like never before. So I think there is, we have to have a commitment to keeping those stories alive. And we should do it. Well, uh, given all that, I know that mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned you uh, are <laughs> hoping someday to live down the comments of uh, comparison back to Game of Thrones. But yeah. I think what we'll see in the future is um, the next, um, a lot of the next big fantasy things will be the insert whatever Dark Star trilogy. Oh, got it. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And I want to thank you for those new adventures you're setting us down. Thank you. Uh, my questions are twofold. Um, first, I need to say I, I finally recognize that you're both. In addition, to, in addition to being a writer, you're a cartographer. Mm -hmm. You've got to be a genealogist at some level. Mm -hmm. So, uh, 
how far back have you traced your family roots? And when you chase a new adventure, where will it take you? What kind of adventure will you be chasing next? What, chasing a what, sorry? What you said chasing what adventure? What kind of adventure would you be chasing next? Oh, oh, oh. Beyond writing. Yeah, um, family roots. We haven't actually gone, gone that, you know, gone that far. Um, largely because my family has a pretty messy history, you know. My, um, um, put it this way, by, the, by 2022, nobody in my family was supposed to have my skin color. So something kind of happened after, like over 100 years ago. Um, somebody married darker instead of lighter, and they split the family apart. We still, we're still feuding, by the way. We tried, hey, we tried to bridge it, you know, because technically the, my name is actually Pringle. You've never seen a Pringle with this skin color, have you? <laughs> and yeah, we tried. We, we even did a reunion. We had the banners made. It was Pringle plus James. We're going to end the feud. We're going to do it. And the day of the party, they went, we have an accident. We can't go. And we just went, the feud is back on. <laughs> Let's do another hundred years of this. So we haven't gone very far other than that part. Um, well, I mean, I'm, I'm still, you know, in this adventure for, for one more book. And then, you know, it's wide open. I am actually, you know, I'm very excited about going back to Jamaica. I'm going to interview my mom and, and, you know, interview her about her mom and, and so on. Just along with fiction, starting to actually, as we say, getting down some oral histories, like including my own family. So I think that's something I'm, I want to do while, you know, while she's still here. I think she's going nowhere. She's like, the Lord is going to come. I'm like, woman, you're not going nowhere. <laughs> um, so there is, so there's that. It's it's the, the the personal histories. I think is the next adventure. Thanks again. Oh, thank you. How are you? How are you doing? Good, good to see you. Thank you for all your brilliant writing. It's really what does it mean that I recognize people even when they're masks on? <laughs> <laughs> good to see you. Um, this was addressed somewhat earlier, but mm -hmm. I'm very curious about your character development mm -hmm. and um, how much you base your characters upon uh, real people you know or have mm -hmm. encountered, and how much on uh, your research, mythology, mm -hmm. folklore, etc. Um, a lot of it is under research because I don't want to get into trouble. <laughs> um, you know, there are aspects of myself. I don't base, base characters on myself, but I think there are moments that it's clearly me. There's there's a scene in um, in Moonwitch where I think somebody asks Sutherland on the wrong question and she goes into how she take her revenge, and I realize, oh yeah, this is me. <laughs> um, uh, you know, so it's. I, I always try to think I'm going to do the Tolstoy thing where you take half of one person's personality and half of another person just make some money out of it. Um, but I still think my friends would really, really, really figure out who is who. I, you know, I, the, the thing about I realized with me though is a lot of times when characters show up, in some ways they're kind of fully formed already. And it's me kind of figuring out what the hell me and these people take as opposed to giving them traits. I feel like I'm discovering traits. Certainly with Sutherland, because I thought I knew her when I started writing this book, I didn't know her at all. Um, and, and, and with a lot of the other characters, um, characters in this book tend to appear then revealed. And I think that's the same thing. It's, it's um, a lot of them I feel, I've always feel, I always feel like people are hiding things from me. And, and to me, I say, I've said a million times that writing to me feels like detective work. And, and that's how I think those, those traits come from, but I think, but, but, they're also, you also have to be careful, one, not to make caricatures, one, not to do the thing that Jane Smiley warned us about, like, don't just project your fears and desires on the character and react to them. Um, she was talking about Heart of Darkness, but I use it for nearly almost every book I don't like. <laughs> um, remembering that, remembering that it's great if your characters leave your novel in a different shape than they enter it. Um, and that they should have the capacity for change, even if they change for the worse, or even if they don't change at all, but they, they're aware, you know, and, um, and when you have all of that, I think you, 
you get a good character there, you can hear what they're saying and then your dialogue may be okay. Thanks, Sin. Thank you. Um, also, uh, I know you've talked about books quite mm. a bit as inspiration, but can you say a couple for you that are the most inspiring, inspiring books in your mm. life toward what in you're life. writing? In life, good lord. Or toward, <laughs> let's say towards what you're writing. Um, well, I mentioned Beloved already, and Song of Solomon, mm -hmm. and of course Wolf Hall. Fantastic intro. Oh, thank you. Song I really got an intro for Song of Solomon. Every now and then I slap myself because I can't believe that happened. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, you know, um, I'm thinking of the books that I reread when I was writing this. I reread Dog Eaters by Jessica Hagedorn, which is one of my all time favorite novels. Um, what else did I read? I fan read Northanger Abbey. I reread re Jane Eyre. That was a riot. <laughs> Um, I still love that book because the feminism in it is really amazing, but damn, she can depend on a coincidence. <laughs> it's like, come on, girl. You don't wake up in the marshes and if your family, the family that you meet just happens to be your cousin. <laughs> like, come on, girl. Um, I, you know, I realize I still love Tenant of Wildfield Hall. It's still the best Bronte. Find me. <laughs> um, and Wuthering Heights is still a mess. Um, yeah, what else was I reading? I, you know, I was reading a lot of comics. I was reading House of X and Powers of X, which I thought was a single hand that got me back into X-Men. Um, but as, in terms of catalog, I really just reread a lot of Toni Morrison. And they, when they asked me to write an intro, it was, it was, in fact, it was the hardest thing I ever did, but I kind of knew what I was wanting to do because I was just rereading yeah. so much of, you know, so much of her. I was reading a lot of Gail Jones. And, and Hilary Mantel, and um, who else was I reading? The, um, the Brontes, um, Jane Austen, pretty much all women authors. Um, and you know, be, because you know, it's it's. I, I remember somebody telling me, and I believe it as well. And it's, this would be weird coming from a creative writing teacher, but there are some things I can't teach you, and there's some lessons in writing you're only going to learn from. And I don't necessarily know what it is because it's a different lesson for everybody. But I think that's why I was reading so much. I was just trying to learn. Yeah. Thank you so much. Cool, thanks. Hey, Marlon. I don't know where the restaurants are. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. I'm not giving you a free book. <laughs> You say you're working on a TV show while you're working on the book. Mm -hmm. So as far as your process goes, uh, did you like, do you split days where you write both in one day or do you have to do like Monday I write book, Tuesday I write, like how's, how's a week look like? Because we all know after your glorious New York Times profile that you don't write on Sundays. Well, no, because I keep work hours. I write on weekdays, and I write, and I'm not nine to five, more like a ten to six. Um, I actually would do, would do alternate days uh, because this is such a different kind of writing, and I didn't know that because I'm not like an experienced screenwriter. Um, but yeah, it, it calls for two different kind of processes, really. Even though both of them are, are directed by voice, I also have to answer to a lot more people with screenwriting, whereas with books, I really don't have to impress my editor. Um, and it's different. I think especially when you're writing a screenplay for a show that say picked up, you, you are writing by a committee. And you are, you know, you have, and everybody feels they have an opinion. And, and one of the cool things I learned from advertising, don't try this at home, is take everybody's suggestion and then wait two weeks and send them the very damn same thing you wrote before. <laughs> and they all go, I love how you address the issue here. Right? And then, yeah. That works sometimes, it doesn't work all the time. But I have tried it. But yeah, I, you know, I, um, I think the bigger, the, 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 the bigger answer is that yes, I set routines. I do believe in routine. Um, if routine has negative connotations, I'll say, well, okay, I set up practice. Um, you know, one of my great creative writing teachers said, you know, if you, if you set a routine, the muses will show up. And, and I actually am a big believer in that. And I think it's, it's um, 
Yeah, when people, I mean, I love when people tell me things over there right when they're inspired. I was like, oh my God, I don't think I've been inspired since the Carter administration. <laughs> and I wasn't inspired by Carter. <laughs> that was, that's an old president in town. <laughs> uh, I know you Gen Z are still know that. <laughs> and then, uh, just super quick, so is there, a, as far as like places that you've written, mm -hmm. like a favorite locale that you've been in, like a really, you still look back and it's kind of like you have to pinch yourself, like I was able to do what I love, what I'm passionate about in this spot, and then if you had to only write in one spot for the rest of your career, oh, where would it be? I don't know if I'd want to do that. Um, New York Orleans is great. Uh, I forgot the first part of your question now. Oh, where's like the, the place that you've been working where you've had to pinch yourself, like I'm actually working here? Um. I mean, God, anywhere with a desk, honestly. <laughs> so, like, uh, you know, I mean, right, you know, the thing, I wrote brief history in pretty much every cafe in Minneapolis. Some of them aren't even around anymore. RIP Coffee News. Uh, yeah. I wrote so much in that damn cafe. I wrote in Astra. I wrote in, what's the one on, there's one on Hennepin. I keep going back to, God, what's it called again? I can't remember the name of it. But, but you know, I mean, anywhere where I can set up and write, I can, you know, so on. I guess the, the, uh, that, I guess applies more to where would I begin a book, because there I need somewhere. Uh, but even then, I, be I began this book on my partner's sister's dining table. So I don't know if I have an ideal place. I'm pretty cool. I mean, if you know somewhere in Capri, that's offering me. Yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, if, if it's somewhere in the south of France, then yeah. If you have the hookup, if that was a really long hint, I know who you are. Thanks. <laughs> Good evening. First book was quite a ride, a lot of work to get Thank through. You. So the first question is the easy one, the mom question. What are the two pages that your mother cannot read in? Story. <laughs> um, well, she can read all of this one, I no, think. No, you said two pages she could not read. Really? Yeah. yeah, you did say that at the very end. I said it didn't. Really? Yeah. Oh, God. Uh, she, she can you know, because you know she already did that. <laughs> no, it says all of this book. Except? Oh, no, no, Brack Leopard, two pages. Yes, yes. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't think she's ready for all that gay sex. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think she's ready two for Two pages of gay sex? I'm sorry. Yeah. There's probably more than two, it's just the hottest part of the scene. So yeah, I don't know, I don't think, I mean, my mom is 86, I don't think she's ready. So then the second question, she brought up sex. So Tracker is impenetrable, mm -hmm. literally and uh, metaphorically. He's a top, total top. Mm -hmm. um, I, love it. This is I, I think they all know what that means. But it was, I wanted to like him, but I kind of found him to be kind of a prick. Mm -hmm. and harsh. So what is he still saying to you, and what mm -hmm. haven't you heard or listened to, where you can penetrate him? Yeah. Well, I mean, he's a prick, and he is. Yeah. He's an asshole. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think he, one, I think he's called out on it, but I also think, I do think he evolves. And then he's a bit tragedy and kind of retro, and sort of, what's the opposite of evolve? Devolves again. Yeah. But I do think, I don't think Tracker realizes he was looking for love, and then he found it. But he kept saying he was looking for it, and he had it twice. Yeah, He's but I mean, about. you know, but people, I mean, I, I knew I wanted to keep a character who was sort of flawed. Well, definitely flawed. Yeah. Um, and, you know, one of the first things I usually say in my class when I'm teaching students is, remember, human beings are the only people who know better but don't do better. Yeah. Um, even when they do know. And, and Tracker, to me, was very emblematic um, of that. I also didn't like him when I started out, you know, writing it, and and yeah, like damn, yeah, man, yeah. But then it goes back to the old thing I said, where I just I feel I just get in and get the story, um, uh, you know, and um, and I, I I I think it's fine when people dislike a character. I have yet to like a single character in Vanity Fair. <laughs> um, but but it's I, I I think dislike is fine. It's indifference that's 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 where really you're in trouble. Sure. Yes. And um and I think you know some in fact George one of the things George Martin is really good at is having you read books where you don't like anybody. Mm -hmm. Um 
but read books where you realize you don't care for anybody. I think that's different, and hopefully I didn't fall into that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does anybody need an explanation of what the whole top thing? <laughs> <laughs>